Good morning, everyone. I'm Laura Gottlieb, the Director of the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar addressing patient social needs, opportunities, and tensions in community-based organization healthcare collaboration. I do want to take the opportunity before I invite our amazing speakers um, to just alert our participants to two upcoming events that are likely to be of interest to those of you turning in today. Uh, the first is that tomorrow, the National Academy of Sciences Engineering and Medicine Committee on Integrating Social Care into the Delivery of Healthcare um, will release its report uh, from, the, from the, a year-long committee deliberation. Um, the, uh, the link to the uh, report webinar or report release webinar um, is available on our website uh, and we will uh, send it out to all participants at the end of today's meeting. The second event that I want to alert you to is the next in our terrific Siren Fall webinar series. So on October 28th in collaboration with America's Essential Hospitals, we are hosting a webinar on clinic-based interventions to decrease food insecurity. Um, you can find information about that on our website as well. Uh, but we hope that uh, these topics will be of interest to many of the people tuning in today. Okay, so with those announcements off my plate, I now have the great privilege of introducing today's fabulous moderator and presenters, each of whom are Siren Frawleagues, which is my new term for friends and colleagues. Our moderator, Tricia McGinnis, is the Executive Vice President and Chief Program Officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Tricia and her uh, colleagues at the Center for Healthcare Strategies work closely with state Medicaid agencies, health plans, and providers on efforts to integrate social care interventions and partnerships into policy and care delivery efforts. And of course, I like to say that the highlight of Trisha's career is that she's a member of the SIREN National Advisory Committee. Joining Trisha, we have two brilliant speakers. Elena Byhoff is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Tufts Medical Center and Tufts University School of Medicine. Lucky for us, she is also on the SIREN Research Advisory Committee. Finally, it gives me no end of joy to welcome our final speaker, this one from across the pond. Hugh Alderwick spent last year, or two years ago actually now, working with our SIREN team on the research he'll be presenting today. Um, when he left San Francisco, much to our chagrin, he became the Assistant Director of Strategy and Policy at the Health Foundation in London, which is an independent foundation that carries out research and analysis to improve health and care in the UK. In that role, he leads their policy research and analysis work. Um, and then finally, I just not only want to thank our speakers for joining us today and for the work that they do in this area, um, but to also the sponsors of both the research and this webinar, including PCORI, Anthem Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and uh, the Blue Shield Foundations of California and Massachusetts. Uh, the last thing that, or actually two more things, and I'm, then you're done with me. Um, the first is if you are having trouble on the uh, telephone audio, um, please uh, try to use the audio through your computers, which we understand is actually crystal clear as well. We've had a few problems this morning with the, with the 800 number. So if that is a problem for you, switch over to the computer audio. And then finally, um, I want to just encourage you all. Oops, I think I want to encourage you all to uh, complete the the evaluation for this webinar that you will get at the end of the webinar. It should be delivered to you via email. Um, we really could use your feedback, and we'll appreciate any comments that you make. And with that, Trisha, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, it's my job really to tee up Hugh and Elena's uh, deep dive into their work around looking at the partnerships between CBOs and uh, healthcare organizations. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to give, uh, I want to give the audience a brief context setting around how um, these partnerships are unfolding in the Medicaid space and how states 
are trying to encourage these partnerships in the broader social determinants work that they're doing. Uh, so, so first, just to highlight, uh, there are a few ways that, uh, that, that state Medicaid agencies are thinking about uh, the social needs of their beneficiaries. First and foremost, it's clearly um, a strategy that most agencies are incorporating into their overall strategies to build uh, and increase the quality of care um, received and the health of their beneficiaries. And they're focused on a, a few uh, populations and the specific needs that are cropping up for those Medicaid, um, those Medicaid beneficiaries. First and foremost, thinking about patients who have really complex health care needs, who have behavioral health, co-occurring behavioral health and physical health needs, who maybe um, end up in the emergency room frequently, who use long-term supports and services, and for whom their social care and social needs are really intimately linked to uh, their, their health uh, that they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day level, and really trying to um, most immediately address those needs for those patient populations. But Medicaid agencies are also thinking more upstream, uh, both around what types of social needs interventions are really critical for um, enabling patients to avoid becoming, uh, uh, avoid having complex health uh, crises, uh, and, and to help both kids and healthy adults uh, engage in social needs that will keep them healthy, uh, that we know are important and have a strong evidence base for promoting long-term health. So these are some of the ways that, that, that Medicaid are thinking about how social needs fit within uh, their population health strategy. There are also two key uh, drivers for why Medicaid now, I think, feels even more empowered to, um, to address what previously was kind of an elephant in the room around how much social needs were driving beneficiary health outcomes. First is uh, the adoption of both value-based payment models and, and, and more sophisticated models to help um, address the needs of complex patients. And the fact that those, mo those, those programs now are creating more of a business case for both managed care plans and healthcare providers to address the social needs of their patients. And secondly, states are receiving signals from their federal partners through regulations and waivers and messaging that, uh, that there are ways in which Medicaid is empowered uh, to address these needs. And so that explains a lot of why, why this is such an, an innovative field, at least, um, at least within Medicaid. So just to drill down that a, a little, bit, um, little bit more, there have been two uh, trends within the federal space. One is uh, in, in 2006, 18, 2016, uh, CMS released revised Medicaid managed care regulations. And I'm not going to go into the, the nitty-gritty details of that, but basically it clarified for both states and plans that there are several leverage points within the managed care regulations that clarify ways in which managed care plans can use their capitation payments to cover and pay for social needs related uh, activities and services. Those fall into to buckets of, of care coordination. Uh, value-added services or services that are directly related to health and in lieu of services. So just getting clarification on the way that managed care plans can use the capitation payments to cover some of these interventions and services was a huge step. Secondly, there have been a uh, significant uptick in um, innovative waivers that states have been using and that CMS has been approving, enabling states to test new ways of um, funneling and, and channeling funding um, and encouraging partnerships that will address these social needs. So with all of that context, what we're seeing is that state agencies are using uh, several different leverage points to really try to encourage providers, health plans to partner with community-based organizations and social service organizations. Those include things like their managed care contracts, program requirements for becoming an accountable care organization or a patient-centered medical home, for example. Uh, they're using financial incentives embedded within their value-based payment work, uh, looking at how quality measurements uh, and types of measures that we use, measures such as kindergarten readiness, can really propel these types of partnerships, and finally, um, ex experimenting with rate setting and how that can enable um, and, and re remove some of the barriers that may be preventing these partnerships from emerging. So back in 2018, CHCS, uh, with some funding from the Association of Community Affiliated Plans, we conducted a comprehensive scan of the, uh, the managed care contracts 
in the 40 states that, ha that use Medicaid managed care in some way, shape, or form, as well as 25 of the 1115 waivers that states have in place right now around delivery system and payment reform. And there are a lot of findings, a lot of interesting findings that we um, were able to discern about, you know, across the country how how states are using their their leverage but a few things that i want to point out that are specific to the topic at hand today around around partnerships with cbo's um, first and foremost the the most common requirements that we found in state contracts were really uh, primarily around screening and referrals and really trying to encourage the uptake of those uh, activities as part and parcel of both managed care and providers day-to-day -day work Secondly, states are using rather rather flexible language within their contracts to try to drive these partnerships. Uh, so the idea being that the folks on the ground in the community, uh, the providers, the CBOs, and the community members, they know what their needs are, and, and it really is um, up to them to figure out um, the type of partnerships that are best suited to meeting the needs of the community, and that um, the state's really trying to create you know, some, some direction around where to go to, but not, not how or, or um, the nitty-gritty of, of the day-to-day -day operational details. Third, um, we did find that 23 state contracts did, in fact, require some type of relationship uh, with the MCO and uh, encouraging the MCO to partner with social service agencies or CBOs. I would say how relationships are defined varies considerably, um, all the way from referrals to more what we would think um, oftentimes is more um, specific relationships around contracts, memorandum of understandings, uh, and other, other mechanisms. And finally, we found that seven states are using their 1115 waivers um, um, to really focus on, in part, on building partnerships and encouraging partnerships between CBOs and healthcare providers. And both Hugh and Elena will drill down um, for you more specifically into how that's playing out uh, on the ground in a few states. So two examples that I thought would be helpful for audience members, um, Michigan, uh, within their managed care contracts, the state is requiring its MCOs as part of its population health strategy to enter into agreements with CBOs. Again, it's kept fairly flexible what that partnership looks like and around what, what health issues, but it is saying, look, managed care organizations as part of your population health work, we expect you to enter into at least one agreement with a CBO to address Social, um, social care needs. Another example is, is New York State. Uh, within their 1115 waiver, they um, are requiring their MCOs to have a significant portion of their contracts with providers in a value-based payment arrangement. And one of the requirements in order for those arrangements to count is that there needs to be an intervention around social determinant of health and that there needs to be a partnership with at least one community-based organization uh, to implement that intervention. And then finally, the managed care organizations must support that intervention uh, with some form of, of funding or other support in advance of that work. So just two examples of, among uh, many around specifically how this is playing out and what Medicaid is, is, is trying to encourage its plans and providers to do. So just in, in close, um, what, what might be coming down the road? Um, what kind of trends ought um, folks be on the lookout for? I think first and foremost, um, I think we can all agree that there will be continued innovation in this, in this realm. Uh, as Medicaid agencies and, and leaders really try to understand what the right mix of incentives, funding, requirements, technical support, and flexibility are needed to truly advance these partnerships between the healthcare systems and community-based organizations. Nobody, I think, at this point pretends to, to have, it, have it right, uh, so we're all learning and innovating um, as we try to really um, point point ourselves in the direction of, of meeting beneficiary social needs. There's also a need um, for greater research into what type of state requirements and, and lever levers are most effective in promoting these partnerships. Uh, we also expect that there will be new federal guidance from the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services, as well as the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation uh, that, that will help um, the field advance this work. And then finally, uh, there's a lot of, 
uh, work being done right now to really understand what the right roles are that both plans and providers can play and how they can complement each other in their work and really uh, leverage their, their respective strengths, um, which are unique and, and can be complementary in this field. So with that um, context setting, I'm going to turn it now to Hugh Alderick, Alderwick to talk about his work in this space. Hugh? Thanks very much, Tricia, and hello, everybody. Um, I know some people have been having trouble with the audio, so to throw into the mix, I've also got an English accent and quite fast talking, so apologies in advance. Um, so I'm going to talk about some research that we've done looking at Medicaid investments uh, and partnerships to address patient social needs in two states, in Oregon and in California. As Laura mentioned at the beginning, this is work that we carried out uh, last year um, in the two states. So I want to start by giving you uh, some very brief context on the states we focused on and the design of the study. Um, so our research focused on understanding Medicaid reforms in these two states, and that's because uh, in very different ways, uh, both states have introduced Medicaid reforms that offer some new flexibilities for healthcare systems to address patients' social needs. In Oregon, I'm sure lots of people will know, uh, a key component of this was the introduction of CCOs, Coordinated Care Organizations, in 2012, uh, which, among other things, are responsible for purchasing and providing care for Medicaid patients with global budgets. Uh, and um, lots of technical detail, but some flexibility within those to divert funding towards some uh, social interventions. Uh, in California, the key reform that we looked at was whole person care pilots, uh, which were established in 2016 under a Medicaid 1115 waiver, which are county-based partnerships between healthcare agencies, local government, and CBOs with the objective of uh, coordinating healthcare services, behavioral health, uh, and social services for the most vulnerable Medicaid patients uh, in their county. And they could choose which their target population was, and they had around 1.5 billion federal funding through 2021 to support those interventions. So the aim of our research was to understand how Medicaid dollars were being used in practice to fund different kinds of social interventions, and then the partnerships that were being developed to deliver those services. We focused on six sites, uh, three in each state, three CCOs in Oregon, uh, three counties in California, and we chose those sites because we knew they were ones who were actively using these flexibilities, so they're not representative. Uh, they're places where we knew things were happening that we could learn from. And the research design was qualitative. So a mix of interviews with the sorts of folks you can see on the slide, site visits. Uh, and the interviews focused on understanding the content of the interventions, how they were funded, and how different organizations work together to deliver services. Uh, and I'm going to focus primarily in the findings on uh, the relationships between CBOs and healthcare organizations. Um, so firstly, we found that all sites in both states were using Medicaid dollars to invest in a range of social interventions, and broadly speaking, they fell into two buckets. Uh, so first is service interventions, which primarily, as Tricia described, uh, focus on identifying and addressing patient social needs directly. So things like screening for social needs in clinics and then care coordination to address things like housing, instability, food insecurity, and so on. The second type of interventions, particularly in California, which I'll talk more about, focused on capacity building. Um, so strengthening healthcare and CBO's ability as organizations to collaborate and deliver social interventions. That's things like data sharing infrastructure, uh, training for community health workers. So these different kinds of interventions created different types of partnerships with uh, CBOs and healthcare system. Um, so if we take direct services, in some cases, uh, that simply involved the healthcare system focusing on developing their own systems to identify social needs in clinical settings. Uh, and then staff like community health workers coordinating with social services and CBOs, so really informal relationships with CBOs based on referrals and primary investments going in the healthcare system. Um, but then... In other cases, uh, healthcare systems had also contracted directly with CBOs to deliver 
social interventions, so much more formal partnerships. For example, in Oregon, um, one CCO had contracted with a housing agency, a family relief nursery, and other CBOs to provide care coordination services, and they were getting directly reimbursed using Medicaid dollars for that. In California, uh, counties, again, were contracting using dollars from the waiver program, uh, typically uh, capitated payments uh, for discrete bundles of care, like care coordination for people with severe housing needs. Sometimes CBOs were also involved in shaping the direction of interventions in these different sites through involvement in cross-sector governance structures, sometimes mandated involvement. Um, in, the, in California, for instance, CBOs often you know, were on the board of whole person care initiatives, but also in CCOs, there's often representation of community organizations on their governance structures. And then in the second type of interventions, capacity building, um, they again created varying kinds of relationships between healthcare and community-based organizations. Um, in some cases, this simply involved contributing to operating costs of uh, CBOs, uh, for instance, using savings from managed care contracts to do that. Um, but in other cases, the interventions focused on actually strengthening and improving the capacity and capabilities of uh, CBOs. So, for example, in California, where a core, core objective of the waiver was in investing in infrastructure for care coordination, uh, one county had established a dedicated team, uh, a community engagement team, which sat in the county health department, uh, had several full-time staff whose job it was to support CBOs uh, with administration to manage grants and contracts, staff training, um, and so that was in direct investment in strengthening the capacity of CBOs to function as organizations and therefore deliver services. So if those are the types of interventions, I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail here, but how were they funded? Um, so we found that a variety of Medicaid funding sources or options were being used to fund different kinds of social interventions or social related interventions. Um, so the first bucket on the left-hand side of the slide is more conventional options that Trisha talked about. Um, so these are sources of funding that you can traditionally get under Medicaid contracts, like under MCO contracts, uh, things like care coordination services. So Trisha, I think, mentioned value added or in lieu of services. Um, and these can cover things like connections with community-based organizations and care coordination. The second more interesting bucket were some of the alternative payment models that were being used in both states to support social interventions. Um, in California, this was typically through bundled payments um, to counties and then sometimes filtered down to providers uh, for discrete chunks of activity like intensive case management uh, for housing agencies. And then finally, uh, in both states, CCOs and counties use savings from capitated contracts to invest in social interventions, and they could use these much more flexibly. Um, so, for instance, in California, several counties are reinvesting savings from their uh, waiver contracts uh, in flexible housing pools. So, if those are the kinds of interventions being delivered, and apologies if I went relatively fast on those, um, I wanted to focus the last handful of slides uh, on some of the key themes in our interviews about how the partnerships between healthcare and community-based organizations were developing. So first, there's five themes here. I think we found, people won't be surprised, broad support for the idea of collaboration from both sides, healthcare and community organizations, that had been spurred on by the policy initiatives that had been developed in both states, and the general consensus that working together was the right thing to do to best support low-income patients, so shared objectives. Um, but in practice, the depth of those partnerships varied extremely widely. Uh, and we found they were often shaped by the history of relationships and collaboration in a particular county or place, and particularly relationships between key individuals in the community in a healthcare setting. Uh, second, uh, we found big differences in the language, aims, and approaches of healthcare and community-based organizations that sometimes uh, got in the way. So at its most trivial, and people will recognize this, this manifested itself in just confusion among uh, community leaders at the endless jargon uh, and acronyms being used in the healthcare system and feeling frozen out of meetings because they couldn't access the language. 
Uh, but more seriously, this sometimes contributed to a lack of understanding uh, among healthcare leaders about the work and value that CBOs brought to the partnership. So, for example, this slide has a quote uh, from one community leader who was exasperated at the healthcare system seeking to hire 20 new community health workers, but not recognizing that her staff perhaps already had these skills, uh, if only they could be used more effectively and acknowledged by the healthcare system. Third was the challenge for some CBOs in taking on new contracts where there was new investment available to work with healthcare agencies. This was not expected from our research, or at least I didn't. Uh, and in California, this was probably the most present. So some Medicaid leaders described how CBOs sometimes lacked the resources and scale needed to take on new county contracts for services under the whole person care program. So for instance, the need to recruit, scale up, boost staff capacity, hold insurance for contracts. This was a big issue in some counties. So the money was available, but the partnerships couldn't always function because of a lack of resources and capacity. Uh, fourth, we found some unintended consequences of healthcare and community partnerships. Um, people will recognize this in their own work, but one example we found was that as healthcare systems increased their own internal capacity and resources, uh, to focus on social interventions. Uh, they risked competing with community-based organizations for the same staff, uh, particularly around community health workers. And then CBOs struggled to compete with the higher salaries and benefits being offered by the healthcare system. So CBOs sometimes losing uh, staff to the healthcare system. Finally, uh, was the very real uh, and present risk of medicalization of patient social needs and the approaches taken to address them both by the healthcare system and CBOs, uh, particularly given a lot of the investment available is from the healthcare system and community organizations having to fit healthcare programs. Now, I know Elena is going to talk about these issues in this theme, so I think I'll leave that to her. So um, to sum up, what, what do I think we can learn from all of this about the relationships between healthcare and community organizations? So there's a few points. Uh, I think three are important. So first, I think our research shows that there's lots of opportunities in the Medicaid system, both the traditional system and through waivers, to fund social interventions and to support stronger partnerships with community-based organizations. Uh, but second, our research clearly showed the complexity of these partnerships. Uh, they're not always easy. They don't always work in the way that we uh, see written in pamphlets uh, by various organizations. And the partnerships are sh shaped by power dynamics, uneven resources between healthcare and community settings, and the broader social policy context in which social services are underfunded and under extreme pressure. Uh, so third, what do we learn? I think for healthcare leaders and policymakers, uh, a key lesson perhaps obviously is the need to understand and acknowledge the significant value that CBOs bring in these partnerships and in supporting low-income people, but also their fragility and therefore the need to support those partnerships, whether it's through technical support or investment, and consider the unintended consequences that partnerships might bring and how they could be mitigated. I think for researchers like me, like Laura, like Tricia, um, we've really got to think about how in our own research we're understanding the voices of community-based organizations, and I think far too few studies uh, have done that properly. I think I'm going to stop there. The last slide is, oh, is yours, Elena, so I'll go back. Hi, thank you. Um, I think uh, we have some real complementary findings, um, and I'm excited to follow, follow you and do kind of a deep dive in one state. Um, so this is a year-long um, qualitative study looking at the community-based organization's perspective on healthcare's entry into social determinants of health. Um, so this is done in the context as states were getting waivers and were doing, looking at alternative payment models under the, C, um, the CMS Innovation Center, ways to kind of think about social determinants of health. Um, Massachusetts uh, decided with it, uh, g gained an 1115 waiver and decided to put all of the covered lives that were currently enrolled in Medicaid in the state into accountable care organizations across the state. And part of the mandate of the accountable care organizations was a focus on population health um, and to include social determinants of health. Um, an interesting aspect of this is they intimated that there should be, but did not formally require, any sort of partnership with community-based organizations. 
And so to kind of set the stage as to why we wanted to take a deep dive into the community-based organization perspective is a lot of the partnership literature looking at healthcare organizations and community-based organizations really did focus more on the healthcare side. Uh, this is a KPMG co-branded paper talking about return on investment and investing in social services um, as, as like an important business case to be made for healthcare organizations. There's a good amount of literature doing um, qualitative work from the healthcare side on leadership and collaboration. It comes across with new innovative findings like leadership is important, communication is important, partnership is important. But we thought that was really kind of water is wet and wanted to take a deeper dive into what the community-based organization perspective was as a lot of these new partnerships were forming across the country. So the research question for us is how are community-based organizations perceiving and responding to healthcare's entry into social determinants of health programming? This was uh, back in the Halcyon days before the 1115 waiver uh, approval was finalized and before the accountable care organization contracts were approved by the Medicaid, um, both in the state and at the CMS level. And so um, these, all of our questions for the community-based organizations were based on what they thought would happen and not necessarily what had happened yet. Some operational def definitions as I go through uh, the talk. The community-based organizations for our study were defined as nonprofit groups that work at the local level to improve life for residents and are not focused primarily on healthcare promotion or delivery. We define the social determinants of health as any upstream environmental or social factors that influence health, so it was a broad net. I'm going to quickly go through the methods. Um, our sampling frame included uh, both social service delivery organizations, so we interviewed homeless shelters, food pantries, community centers, and the like, people that directly provided social services. We also included umbrella social service organizations, professional organizations and advocacy organizations, also feeder organizations. So for instance, in Boston, there's the Greater Boston Food Bank, which operates almost as a large um, food bank collection. It pro provides delivery and services to all the individual food, site, food bank delivery sites, but you cannot walk into the Greater Boston Food Bank as an individual with food insecurity and go shopping. And so um, both large and small organizations were included. Um, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 47 different organizations across the state of Massachusetts targeting CBO leaders and directors. It was a purposeful sample with a snowball strategy. Um, prior to the ACO launch in Massachusetts, there was a listening session um, that was held by the state um, before the launch. and we targeted all the community organizations that attended the listening um, session with the understanding that they would likely be the ones with most likely to have thoughts and input and feedback on what a CBO uh, healthcare partnership would look like. We collected data from October 2017 to March 2018. March 2018 was the launch of the ACO contracts. And we used a grounded theory comparative coding approach to code all 47 transcripts. We also impaneled an advisory board that include members of CBO leadership from around the state, public health leaders including mass health members, um, and healthcare leaders that were participating in the ACO design from the healthcare side. We met with the advisory board twice during the study at the halfway point and then at the end to run, back, run by all of our findings to make sure that they accorded with their lived experience and their perspectives. The resulting sample was a total of 47 uh, organizations with, you'll see a heavy representation on housing that was done with intention. We knew that housing was going to be a priority social area that um, the Mass Health and Medicaid waiver was going to focus on. Um, and there was a large um, housing first um, wave of ACO focus. Uh, so we wanted to oversample housing providers in, in the study. So our findings, similar to Hugh, we found five emergent themes um, once we coded and reviewed all the interviews. The first was that healthcare and CBOs have different values. The second was that how CBOs were perceiving the healthcare social determinants of health strategy. The third was that despite these differences, the CBOs felt that this was policy moving in the right direction to form CBO and healthcare partnerships. The fourth was that CBOs were in fact positioning themselves to be better partners with healthcare organizations. And the last were fears, risks, or unintended consequences. So Hugh and I had some overlap in what we found. 
So from the first finding, healthcare and CBOs have different values. Um, one of the important findings is that outcomes were different between healthcare and CBOs. This uh, interviewee said, the Department of Housing and Urban De Development measures the city on a number of new people into homelessness. So I don't want Hospital A or Hospital B or anybody sending people here that aren't genuinely homeless. One of the things we worry about is driving our numbers up inadvertently. So there were some, some concerns about misalignment between outcomes for the CBO and outcomes for the hospital. There was another concern about scaling versus flexibility. I think that one thing that runs through everything we do, and that's a CBO, is relationship, and I think the idea of scaling and relationship are at odds. So, so similar to how Hugh discussed the idea of scale and capacity in CBOs, the, our CBOs recognized the difference, but they also necessarily, didn't necessarily think that scale was the right tact to follow, and were concerned that scale would lose community responsiveness, which was their primary goal. Second, how CBOs perceive healthcare social determinants of health strategy. A lot of community-based organizations felt that the healthcare strategy was motivated by funding and return on investment. We thought five to ten years ago that it was time to talk to healthcare institutions and it was way too early. They weren't ready yet, nor was it really in their financial interest. Now it's starting to be. They felt that incentives through the MassHealth waiver, the Medicaid waiver, um, was aligning their interest with CBO, the CBO interest and the healthcare interest more than previously had been. Another uh, recurrent phrase we heard was not at the table, that the CBOs were not being included as policy decisions were being made. One CBO leader said, honestly, my fear right now, we are so late as a community, like quality metrics at MassHealth are being finalized right now and we were not invited to the party. The third theme is that despite these differences and despite feeling that they were not at the table, CBOs felt that this was in general policy moving in the right direction and they offered a conceptual rationale for that. It's moving in the right direction. This idea of fracturing a person into medical care and social care is ridiculous. It doesn't make common sense and it's not working. People need this service and it should just be part of holistic patient-centered care. And so thinking that it was policy movement in the right direction, community-based organizations were positioning themselves to be better partners with healthcare organizations. And so one of the things that community-based organizations were doing were measuring work in terms of health. And one uh, food bank said, we are changing our metrics. We've gone from pounds of food towards, more towards healthy meals. When we do that, our numbers change, and it's going to take a while for people to understand that pounds doesn't really capture what we're doing. So this leader went on to say that the numbers actually looked much lower because pounds of food that they delivered was higher than the number of healthy meals, and it took a lot of convincing of the board that this was the right direction to go, but that healthcare organizations would appreciate that. CBOs were also creating service line menus to offer healthcare organizations to choose from. Healthcare centers all have different strengths and in infrastructure. So when we offer this three-pronged program, we do it as a menu of options. We say, hey, these are the three things that we can offer. Where are you guys at? And so the idea that not all healthcare organizations wanted the same services was a, co a common theme among uh, some of the community-based organizations. Finally, the fears, with risks, and unintended consequences. Trapped and vaporized uh, was a very common uh, concern for a lot of the community-based organizations. And the trapped and vaporized returned to the, uh, reference the dollars that were coming from the state um, in various program forms to encourage these community partnerships. This uh, health, uh, CBO leader said, my concern is that it's a money grab. There won't be dollars for the services people on the ground need to have positive lived experiences. The medical industry will absorb the resources. Um, the, another unintended consequence or risk was the loss of intrinsic value in the medicalization of community-based organizations, and Hugh touched on this as well. And it was a concern that um, that's highlighted by this uh, community-based organization leader who said, I'm concerned that healthcare will want to make this into tight compartments. They'll want to define it, encapsulate it, put borders and boundaries around it, and it will no longer be a social determinant. It will be a new service line. And so what are the implications? And so we were concerned, and our CBO interviewees were concerned, of potential loss of some intrinsic value to the CBOs. 
when we thought about what was happening with the community-based organizations on the ground as there was this external pressure to partner with healthcare organizations, the kind of metaphor for this entire study and our findings was like a plant growing towards the light. And that community-based organizations were moving away from their kind of true roots in the community towards where the kind of money and resources and political capital from the healthcare partners were coming from. And so there was some concern that as the community-based organizations kind of grew towards healthcare, there would be loss of community organizing and development, some of the essential functions of community organizations that are not reimbursable or, or not direct ser social service provisions. Um, there would be loss of cultural attentiveness, and this would come as part of scaling to meet healthcare organization needs. Um, there would be a trade-off in terms of pursuit of long-run outcomes. A lot of the community organizations we interviewed discussed intergenerational improvements in the community and intergenerational improvements um, with families that they worked with, but they had mentioned a lot of kind of small-scale intermediate health outcome concerns were really what uh, healthcare organizations were presenting as outcomes that they were interested in. And then the concern uh, about loss of attention to uninsured and marginal groups. By definition, if a community organization is partnering uh, with a, an accountable care organization under a Medicaid contract, you're looking to provide services to those that are insured under the Medicaid contract. And so the uninsured folks who are in the community were really losing some of the attention from the community-based organizations. And so, you know, this is how I got the title of the presentation based on a, a quote from one of our uh, community-based organization leadership. And they were talking about how special services provided by the community-based organization um, really embedded in the community meant so much to them and how is just is it going to be a very change of change of organization to work with healthcare and they said the social service workforce that's going to be partnered with healthcare they need to be some special people i call my team unicorns and i know you can't scale unicorns too well and so just thinking in the in the longer term about you know what were some policy strategies that we drew from from this study that we actually fed back to uh, Massachusetts Medicaid before they finalized some of the language in some of their programs meant to encourage these community-based partnerships. Um, one was policy and grant flexibility. Um, thinking about the fact that you know, if you target very narrow communities or you're looking for very narrow um, outcomes, it's much harder to, to, to allow a community-based organization to do what they really do and do it well because they then will continue to, to focus on healthcare outcomes and healthcare dollars um, rather than serving the whole community in a need. Um, the great irony is that's the opposite of what ended up happening once the Massachusetts Medicaid language came out in terms of how they wanted flexible services run and it became a very narrow program. The other concern was common measures and that um, a healthcare organization looking, about in, looking at intermediate health outcomes like diabetes measures or hypertension measures were not well aligned with the kinds of things community-based organizations were looking at and where might they be able to find some overlap um, between the two organizations or the two uh, sectors so that they can agree um, on a common goal. And so I just wanted to acknowledge my co-investigator and our advisory board who had a, a lot of um, insight and input into, into our findings. And I, I wanted to toss it back to Tricia to wrap it up with the question. Great. Thank you so much, Elena and Hugh, for those presentations. Those are, I know just the tip of the iceberg, um, so I definitely encourage folks to, uh, to go and, and read the papers that both Hugh and Elena presented on because there's a lot of rich information in there. But I will start, um, we've gotten a lot of really good questions in through the chat box, um, so I'm going to try to get through as many of those as we, as we can. Um, what, one question is, is really around capacity building around CBOs. And um, the, the writer writes, you know, one key issue is the degree to which these relationships incorporate um, in investment or financial support into the cap capability or capacity of the CBO, the capacity to deliver health outcomes in, in, in accord with evidence-based models at scale, the capacity to track and report on program interventions and outcomes. Based on the work on your interviews and your, your work in the field, um, I'm curious what what you all can say about what is what we know about the funding of CBO capacity um, and what's needed in terms of CBO capacity to really enable strong performance um, in the collaboration with healthcare providers and payers. So 
I don't know who you want to go first, Tricia, but um, from the work we did in the two states, so we were sort of really finding out what was happening. So we can't really tell you about what was working better or worse, but it was interesting. We saw sort of two types of investment in CBO capacity. One was, and this is particularly in California, where the waiver, the conditions of the waiver had made money available for infrastructure developments, not specifically for CBOs, but just generally infrastructure developments that could support better care coordination. So some of the support was really about sort of helping CBOs uh, respond to grants, to scale up, to manage contracts. It was sort of administration support, so that's around specific interventions that could be delivered and more about you know, being a well-functioning organization that could scale up and take on contracts to run uh, some of these whole person care services. Uh, the second types of interventions was around sharing data, so IT infrastructure. And so that didn't just benefit CBOs, it benefited the healthcare system, so better ways of uh, identifying high-risk, high-cost patients uh, and seeing where they pop up in different parts of the system uh, and therefore being able to collectively as a system better uh, support the sort of the highest risk patients. So those were two sorts of interventions that we saw, but uh, they were, this is when money had been freed up specifically for that purpose. The risk and the worry that everybody had was that, well, the, the money for this purpose is not going to be made available after the waiver, or we have to extend the waiver or we have to do something else. So the sustainability of those investments uh, was quite uncertain. Yeah, in um, Massachusetts, it was in um, it was a big free rider problem, and so the the unique kind of challenge in the accountable care organizations, especially here in Boston, where approximately um, two thirds of our interviews took place, was that um, any healthcare organization that invested in a social service organization in Boston, the social service organization or the community based organization would essentially serve all the other Boston area ACOs because geographically they were really constrained and that um, it was impossible for one kind of ACO to invest dollars in capacity or infrastructure without all the other ACOs um, getting benefit. And so that was fed back to the state that because of that, a lot of the um, accountable care organizations were very hesitant to give any dollars to the community organization for scale or capacity. And it was actually um, fed back to the state and the state decided to have a separate budget for um, capacity scale and technical assistance for the community-based organizations. Um, this is all kind of happening as we talk on this webinar right now, um, and so it's you know it's unclear what exactly the downstream consequences will be, um, but it was it was definitely seen as something that was not in the purview of the accountable care organizations in Massachusetts to touch, just because um, there was such a big investment necessary. So that I mean I think that raises a question, Elena. Getting back to you know some of the things that states are grappling with about about their role um, in this, and you noted earlier in your presentation around you know ways in which flexibility was really helpful. I'm wondering for both of you in your interviews, were there um, were there other reflections that the CBOs or the healthcare organizations had about where? Um, where greater uh, definition or prescriptiveness um, that the state could provide would be beneficial or specific insights on you know, new roles that the state um, ought to be playing in supporting these partnerships but maybe wasn't playing. I'm curious if you all uh, had any thoughts from your interviewees around, around that question. So perhaps I'll go first. So, I mean, in our sites, there was a mix of flexibility and prescriptiveness, and I think they both had, they both brought the positives and negatives to both. So on the payment side, uh, so some flexibility about uh, within sort of capitated budgets, what could be spent. Um, so some flexibility helped. Uh, so it allowed investment in social interventions that perhaps would not be usually allowed. Uh, but... Uh, there was just still widespread confusion about exactly which interventions could be funded and how they would be incorporated in rate setting and all the complexity of payment. But to more clarity, in some ways, the flexibility supported investment in those interventions, uh, but also uh, the lack of clarity was sometimes difficult and confusing, and so sometimes led to a big variation in what was funded. Uh, that's a, a second point about the flexibility is that 
given there's limited evidence about which types of social interventions from a healthcare perspective, partnering with CBOs work best for particular outcomes. We saw quite wide variation in the types of interventions that were funded. Um, so the flexibility means that you've got variation and perhaps that means that in some places they could be doing something else uh, if the state was more prescriptive about which types of interventions that might deliver uh, better outcomes. I think where the prescriptiveness was helpful um, is that in, in California, for instance, the whole whole person care program is quite prescriptive. Partnerships have to be created in counties. Uh, a set of interventions has to be developed to try and coordinate care uh, and improve social factors for the most high-risk patients. And so the whole structure of the waiver and what was being delivered in counties uh, had come down from the state about the requirements for receiving the funding for the program. So I think that the lesson there is that the state can do a lot to say, I think that you know targeting resources to this group of patients is the right thing to do. You have to work together as a community and a healthcare system to deliver those, and there's some flexibility about the types of interventions funded. So I think there was strengths and weaknesses to both the flexibility and the prescriptiveness. Yeah, in Massachusetts, um, we hypothesized that flexibility would be useful because it would allow um, community-based organizations to continue to do the work that they did without having to spend more time meeting the healthcare organization needs. But what ended up happening on the ground is it became a very prescriptive program um, that was only addressing very narrow slices of housing and homelessness and um, nutritional support. And what ended up coming out was very different from uh, what was anticipated, you know, two years ago when we first started conducting these interviews. Um, and I know that it has, <clears throat> I don't necessarily know, it, I mean, it has structured which community-based organizations are most likely to partner with healthcare. So it's really narrowed the field. If you're only focusing on two domains that you want to address, it really changes the scope of which community-based organizations can be your partners. Um, and I think they're going to be, you know, interesting lessons to learn from that. Great. Thank you all. Um, a question has come in, uh, a great question around the, the relationship between social determinants of health and, and health equity, um, noting that, you know, really social determinants of health is, is, is you know, one related goal to achieving health equity, but, but they're not the same. Um, they, they really are two, two distinct issues. And I so I guess the question for you all is, I mean, given um, both obviously the re relevance and importance of social determinants, but, but how, it, how social determinants relates to broader issues around improving health equity, um, just reflections on how, how those two topics are, are playing out among the interviewees uh, that, that you talk with, you know, did, did um, issues of health equity come up in your conversations and, and any, any reflections that you can share around how the partnerships or the CBOs are thinking about improving health equity in the context of the work that they're doing around social determinants of health? Um, I, I can jump in and answer this. So um, I would say that the CBOs, some of them, ha definitely had an eye towards health equity and understanding um, that they, as a community-based organization, were kind of serving the folks who had the least access and the least status, um, and they were, they were keeping an eye towards that. But um, there was a lot of cynicism from the community-based organization perspective as to what the healthcare side was doing, um, and I, you know, in reading this question, I, I think maybe the the asker is, is <clears throat> intimating something in terms of that the healthcare maybe doesn't see it as an equity issue, um, which I think was something that I we had come across that it was it was seen as a population health savings mechanism. Um, and an incentive model for the healthcare systems, not necessarily an equitable distribution of resources. And so I think the, the positions from where the community-based organizations were viewing their work and their goals um, were definitely not in, the, in alignment with the way healthcare was viewing social determinants of health as a priority. I think that's a great answer, which covers much of what I would have said, so I don't want to add too much. The only thing uh, that I would say is because we were looking at the Medicaid system, I think in many places there was really close alignment actually in the overarching values in terms of serving low-income patients and trying to improve their lives. Um, but from CBOs there was some 
uh, some challenges about what, what outcome measures was the healthcare system using to judge success, particularly around reducing hospitalizations and costs for uh, the highest cost sickest patients in the healthcare system when perhaps resources could have been used for different types of interventions if you had really just serving those communities was your primary outcome measure. So there was tensions in what outcome measures and metrics were being used to judge success that we found in, in both states. Great. Well, I think we um, are, are right at time. So I just want to thank Hugh and Elena for, for taking time with us to share, um, share some of the results of your fascinating work. Um, I definitely encourage folks to check out uh, the reports and their papers um, on which this work is based. And just on, on behalf of the SIREN Network, I want to thank everybody for attending and, uh, and sharing your great questions. Have a great day.